Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So hello everyone. Welcome to the second to last installment of the SimCell 2021 speaker series. My name is Jacqueline Delora. I'm a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research in the Cellular Biophysics Department. I'm in the lab of Professor Spat. Um, a couple of announcements before we get going. There is one more seminar series uh, next Monday on the 17th of May that will launch us into our conference. I and mean, as you can see here, the registration for the virtual conference is already open. You can go to simcell2021.unm.edu to register. And also our poster previews will begin tomorrow and you can find more information on them at the website as well. So today we have two excellent speakers here, um, Professor Neil Devaraj and Dr. Emiliano Altamira. It is my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Professor Neil Devaraj, who will start the seminar today. He did his undergrad at MIT and doctoral studies at Stanford University, where he earned his PhD in chemistry in the labs of Professor James Coleman and Christopher Chidsey. He then was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School in the lab of Professor Ralph Weisleder and subsequently joined the faculty at UCSD. Professor Devaraj focuses on the design of chemoselective reactions to address problems in bottom-up synthetic biology and molecular imaging. I will turn it over to Professor Devaraj now and remind the audience to submit your questions through the Q&A button on your Zoom interface. So thank you, Dr. Devaraj, whenever you're ready. Yeah, so uh, can you see the screen? Yes, it looks great. Great, well, yeah, uh, I just wanna first thank the organizers for the invitation. And um, yeah, it's, of course, it's a shame was looking forward to the large conference that we're gonna do, but of course this is a necessity. Um, and really great that we have this opportunity to get together and, and talk about, I think a topic that's of interest to all of us here at HR, synthetic cells. So I'll share with you a little bit today what my lab's been working on in trying to uh, mimic lipid membranes. So, you know, I think this is, uh, uh, not a, a, a something I need to convince the members of this audience, but I think one of the really major questions in science today is although we have, um, you know, a lot of knowledge and a good understanding of how the molecules of life work, uh, trying to understand how these molecules come together and organize themselves to, to, to create structures, namely cells that have the, you know, fascinating properties of life this is still really quite unknown. And so there's a lot of work in trying to understand how, how do we sort of transform, if you will, you know, chemistry to biology. And this is something that my lab is, is really quite um, engaged in right now. And we really think that one of the, the, you know, the main issues is compartmentalization. So as you know, compartmentalization is an absolute requirement for life. Uh, compartments couple uh, metabolism and replication. They also localize entropy reducing processes. And uh, the you know, major way in which cells, which are the minimal unit of life, compartmentalize themselves either from the environment or internally in the case of eukaryotic cells is through the use of lipid membranes. And so lipid membranes are really kind of a remarkable uh, 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 material. You know, it's, 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 it's really fascinating to think that you know, a, a four to five nanometer thick bilayer of amphiphilic molecules that are held together by the hydrophobic effect and self-assemble is what's really defining the, the boundaries of life. And lipid membranes have, serve a number of important roles in cells in promoting and protecting chemical reactions, controlling uh, the exchange of matter and energy with the environment, defining boundaries and maintaining ion and pH gradients. And I think if we're, you know, really thinking then about mimicking life, it really is um, the one place to, to really think about is trying to mimic the compartment of life. In that case, that we have to sort of gain a better control then over lipid membranes. So, you know, the typical way in which um, many people reconstitute uh, lipid membranes and, and form vesicles is by hydrating a thin film of dried phospholipids. And, and that will result in, in membrane-bound vesicles. But you know, these are really quite simply passive containers in many ways. I mean, we, we can 
be forgiven for thinking about them as sort of static compartments. And instead, you know, the, the vesicle itself, the membrane isn't that interesting. It's really the stuff that's inside that's really interesting. But if we compare this to um, membranes in living cells, well, really nothing could be further from the truth because membranes in living cells are highly dynamic, far from equilibrium structures that are undergoing constant formation, degradation, uh, growth, fission, et cetera. And so really one of our um, goals in our lab um, is to try to be able to emulate lipid membranes so that they're more dynamic and, and lifelike. Now, the idea of mimicking lipid membranes isn't completely new. Uh, about 40 years ago, the late Jano Svendler came up with, a, I think, a wonderful term, membrane mimetic chemistry. And his idea was to, to create systems that mimic aspects of biomembranes. But at the time, you know, 40 years ago or so, the really emphasis was on trying to use amphiphiles and self-assemblies to for practical applications. You know, could you control the rate of organic reactions within these micelles, for example? Could you enhance solar energy conversion, do targeted drug delivery? And in fact, you know, at the time, he really sort of went out of his way to make it to make sure there was really wasn't um, an area for faithfully you know, reproducing the features of biological membranes. But I think now, you know, 40 years later, we can, you know, revisit this concept of membrane and chemistry and, and actually expressly go after trying to mimic the biological properties of membranes and think about using the cell's inspiration to develop minimal chemistry so that we can mimic properties like, you know, growth, division, transport processes, and even mesophase uh, transitions. And simultaneously, as we start you know, developing these and mimicking these membranes, we're going to you know, be developing a, a suite of tools and have a much better understanding of how to manipulate lipids. And I think these can be fed back into living cells to help us understand the roles of lipids in life. For example, you know, what are the specific uh, functions of particular lipid species? We make thousands of different lipid species, you know, what are the functions of each of these? Or can we potentially develop tools to image and track lipid species in cells? So as I mentioned, you know, when we, when we first sort of started our group, the typical way of generating lipid membranes was to hydrate, you know, thin lipid membrane films, or there's more sophisticated techniques that use phase um, separation. But, you know, in terms of cells, well, cells build their lipid membranes uh, de novo, and they do this through coupling chemistry with self-assembly. And it's really kind of typified by the so-called Kennedy de novo synthesis pathway, where you build up the acyl chains by fatty acid synthesis, and these are coupled to uh, membrane-bound to, to polar head groups by membrane-bound acyl transferases. And so, we were interested in trying to mimic the growth of lipid membranes, but we felt that this was really rather complicated to try to reconstitute the entire pathway. And so we began to look for other ways in which we could try to mimic lipid membrane synthesis. And, you know, really quick refresher for, you know, why are we interested in phospholipids in particular in trying to mimic lipid membranes? Why are phospholipids a privileged molecule? Well, if we look at a phospholipid, it's head group in two acyl chains. The cross section of the head is about the same as those of the chains. And so it has a, a cylindrical like shape to it and it'll pack to form more planar bilayers. In contrast, if you were to lop off one of these acyl chains, you would form a more conical shaped molecule. And this is gonna to wanna to pack to form my cells instead. And so knowing that we were drawn to another lipid synthesis pathway in biology known as the land cycle or remodeling pathway. And this pathway already formed phospholipids or cleaved by a phospholipase forming a lysophospholipid. It's coupled to a thioester derivative of a fatty acid by a lysophospholipid acyl transferase. And so what was inspiring to us about this is that you have now a process by which you have two single chain precursors, neither of which have that, you know, the right shape to form membranes, coupled together in a single coupling step by an enzyme to form a membrane forming phospholipid product. And so we thought, you know, this kind of idea of just putting two chains together, that's something we could mimic using chemistry. And so, you know, really the concept is, you know, can we couple together these two single chains and form a phospholipid and that presumably would lead to a bilayer. What's kind of interesting is this, I, this, this sounds simple in principle, but it would involve so-called de novo membrane formation, that is membrane formation in the absence of pre-existing membranes. So I think many of us here are familiar 
with cell theory and the statement that all cells come from cells that I guess in, the people in our community are trying to you know, prove this is not true. And, and we know it's not true you know, from an evolutionary perspective. But in 1980, uh, Gunter Blobel in a very famous PNAS paper extended this concept to membranes, stating that you know, all membranes come from membranes. And that's a pretty bold statement, but to my knowledge, um, there's not really one verified example of biology making a membrane, you know, in the absence of a membrane. All these membranes are coming from membranes. And this kind of makes sense because, you know, membrane lipid synthesis is catalyzed by a series of membrane-bound enzymes. And these membrane-bound enzymes require pre-existing membranes for proper folding and function. So there's kind of a, a chicken and the egg uh, paradox here. And so it does kind of lend itself to this question of, well, you know, can de novo membrane formation occur, period? And so the very first example we did is we, we, we decided to you know, utilize a very selective chemical reaction, sort of commonly known as click chemistry. And we chose this reaction because it's highly, highly yielding and also works very well in water. And you can now couple together this azide and alkyne and form this artificial triazole phospholipid. And in water, you can actually watch membrane formation take place. So this is a, a dye that's staining membranes. And when you add the catalyst, you get nice fields of vesicles. And after 12 hours, you, you're, you're left with nothing but vesicles. You've consumed all the reactant. And this can be done with other reactions. This is an example um, called the native chemical uh, ligation, where what's nice about this is you actually use a thioester precursor, similar, similar to how biology makes lipids. And here, both these precursors, in fact, form my cells. And on the right here, I'll show you this video where we mix these together, and you can see the formation of these sort of tubular structures that grow with time. And then they, they grow uh, sort of longer its peers. And then after the reaction nears completion, they become more spherical in nature. And just one last thing here, you know, we very recently even shown you can make uh, natural phospholipids using similar kinds of concepts. Um, a really great postdoc in my lab, Lu Ping Lu, showed that if you actually make thioesters with um, thiocholine and oleic acid, um, those positively charged now thioesters can react um, and isolate natural lysophosphatidylcholines forming natural phospholipids. And these can also spontaneously form membranes de novo. And they can also support ion gradients. So, you know, most of my lab has been, you know, for, the, for the most of the time we've been really focused on sort of mimicking fossil and vesicle formation. And these fossil and vesicles are great because they're compatible with biochemistry and they can maintain ion gradients. But when we start thinking about, you know, utilizing these systems as sort of synthetic organelles or um, bioreactors, we're faced with some issues. So um, yes, the fossil lipids maintain ion gradients, but that's because they're impermeable. And that impermeability, um, we need to have to tackle if you want to start getting, you know, reactants into the vesicles and waste products out. And so what you, that means is you really need a sophisticated transport machinery system. And obviously biology gets around this because they've evolved, you know, biology has evolved over billions of years, really sophisticated transport proteins. But these are often very challenging to reconstitute in vesicles. Now, recently in our lab, a few years ago, in fact, we started exploring an interesting class of amphiphiles. We, just, we actually pretty much just stumbled across. Um, and these are these uh, non-ionic uh, amphiphiles uh, gly glycolipids that have galactose head groups. And it turns out that these single chain amphiphiles surprisingly will form giant vesicles. And because they're single chain amphiphiles, um, the permeability of small molecules to these vesicles is greater than phospholipids. In fact, you can do biochemical reactions like rolling circle amplification reactions inside these vesicles and feed the precursors from the outside. And while we were exploring these you know, amphiphiles, which can be made from thioester coupling or even from amide coupling, we started thinking about ways in which we could try to reconstitute membrane proteins. And so a student in my lab, Anjit Bhattacharya, um, began exposing these galactolipids to a uh, detergent called IGPAL that's often used for membrane protein reconstitution. And in doing so, he noticed something really quite uh, surprising. So when he mixed these two together, Rather than seeing vesicles, he noticed these droplets in solution. And it was a very spherical structures. If you put you know, dye that goes in the droplets, they'll phase separate with time. And that can be easily you know, observed that you, you can see that. So it definitely is a phase separation. And the droplets um, can be made through a variety of ratios of IUPAL and the galactolipid. 
So if you have a lot of the galactolipid, you get vesicles. If you have a lot of this detergent, you get micelles, but a lot of ratios, you'll get droplets. And so when we first saw this, we thought, well, you know, we have these two non-ionic um, amphiphilic molecules, they're very greasy, probably we're making oil droplets. And you notice that there's a galactose head group here. So we, we took a fluorescent protein that binds to galactose and added it to the, to the mixture, thinking, okay, well, maybe we can decorate you know, the periphery of these droplets. But when we did that, instead of seeing the periphery light up, we saw the entire droplet be stained and labeled, the interior included. And so this forced us to rethink you know, what we potentially had on our hands. And so Anjit, you know, to his credit, uh, actually collaborated with the Sunil Sinha lab in physics here at UCSD and started teaching himself a variety of characterization techniques. Um, they're often used in soft matter physics. So he you know, did so small angle X-ray scattering, neutron scattering, uh, cryo-TEM, cryo-SEM, and eventually came to the conclusion that we, we don't really have droplets, but we, in fact, what we believe is happening is there's actually a phase transition occurring and you're going from you know, the lamellar phase, which is sheet-like and what we typically think of when we think of lipid membranes, to what's known as a bicontinuous sponge phase. And so this bicontinuous sponge phase is in, rather than sheet-like, it's a sort of three-dimensional network of bilayers um, and water channels. And so the, um, the, 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 it's bicontinuous, it's throughout the whole droplet. And that also explains why these proteins could stain the interior of the droplet is there's, there's basically water channels and pores all around the, the interface between the two phases. And so, you know, as long as the molecules are small enough to go through the pores, which are about four nanometers in diameter, and we know that from the, the X-ray scattering data, um, the, the molecules can enter into the droplets. And so these droplets can be made by um, different chain lengths of galactolipids and different kinds of um, surfactants that are similar to IGPAL, like Tritonex, for example. And you know, one thing I should point out that I think is, is very interesting is that you know, these kind of non-lamellar bicontinuous phases have actually been observed in cells in many different organelles. Um, for example, in plants, uh, there's an organelle known as a prolamellar body. That's quite interesting. But also, um, people have shown that you can overexpress certain membrane proteins and trigger the formation of uh, non-lamellar phases in the endoplasmic reticulum. And also, you know, quite, I think, topical for us right now, um, actually, you're, th these kind of phases that are bicontinuous are often seen in cells that are infected with viruses. So this is actually a virus cell that's been infected by SARS-CoV. And the ER has now undertaken this sort of what they would call a cubic phase morphology. And um, in fact, what you're seeing here in these dark um, objects are uh, vir virus particles. So it's thought that the cubic phase or the, uh, the non-lamellar phase is actually serving as a depot sequestering viral pro uh, particles. So in thinking about this, we, we started realizing, well, maybe we could potentially utilize these um, droplets as synthetic organelles. So you had to ask, ask a few questions before doing that. You know, one, how stable are these systems? So um, it turns out that in fact, they're very stable to different pH. So you can you can scan pH two to 10, different salt concentrations, stable to magnesium and calcium, for example, stable in seawater, stable in cell media, they're even stable in cell-free transcription translation systems like the PEER system. And a wide variety of small molecules, fluorescent dyes, for example, can readily get enriched in these droplets. Um, the story here is very simple, pretty much the more hydrophobic the dye is, the more it gets enriched in the droplet phase. I think more interesting is protein sequestration. So it turns out that galactophilic proteins like LEC A, LEC I, or galactin three will all get um, you know, enriched in the droplets. Um, and so these, in this case, we have fluorescent versions of these proteins. And we can see you know, even a hundredfold enrichment compared to the bulk of these proteins in the droplets. And we can actually even reach millimolar concentrations of droplets, we estimate, millimolar concentration of proteins we estimate in the droplets. So one way of seeing this is we can actually add the droplets to the cell-free transcription translation system, like the PEER system, and um, also add the DNA encoding for a green fluorescent protein fused to LEC A, which would bind the galactose head groups. And these, you know, the, the droplets in the PEER system are, are mutually compatible. So we can actually watch then protein expression in the presence of these droplets. And so this is phase contrast. You can see the droplets, hopefully. 
And then now we add the DNA and watch, and you can see the droplets just light up. And that's because as you're forming this GFP like A, it's basically immediately getting sucked into these sponge droplets. And so it's a kind of really nice way of sucking in um, proteins that have affinity. But, you know, of course, you know, the idea of trying to like fuse a protein of interest to a lectin or, is not really that convenient. And so we were looking for other ways in which we can program what goes into the droplets. So, you know, GFP on its own doesn't partition spontaneously into the droplets. And so we thought the fact that the, the, the even though it's a, you know, non-lamellar phase, it's still consisting of these network of bilayers. Perhaps one week we could program what goes in is by doping in functional amplifiles at a low percentage. So as an example, we can dope in a low percentage of a nickel NTA uh, binding phospholipid, where now a polyhistag protein would bind in the presence of nickel to this phospholipid. And when we do that, now um, histag GFP goes into the droplets. If we don't dope in that lipid, we don't get any uh, partitioning. And this game can be played over and over again. So you can take a mannose binding, uh, a man mannose containing lipid, dope that in, now mannose binding lectins go in. Um, you can put a positively charged lipid in, now negatively charged oligonucleotides go in, and you can take a biotinylated lipid, and now fluorescent stripped avidin goes in. So this is, turns out to be a really convenient way to, to, to dope in um, you know, various um, uh, compounds and program what proteins go in, and we're, we're exploring this even more now in our lab with other types of affinity schemes. So then the question is, well, can we actually then use these droplets to act as artificial organelles and mimic functions that occur in organelles like lipid synthesis, protein degradation, or you know, sequestering or, or protecting biomolecules? So before doing that, you know, a postdoc in my lab, Henrique Niederholtmeyer, was interested in asking, well, you know, if we put something into the droplets, are they static or are they mobile? You know, are things moving around the lipids, the proteins? If we want to have reactions to occur in the droplets, we would kind of like things to be mobile. Now, we, 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 we saw from just watching these droplets that they seem to be liquid-like. And you can see this from you know, the droplets just coalescing with one another. Um, but Henrique really wanted to get more quantitative about this. And so she did uh, you know, uh, put in various types of fluorescent lipids or fluorescent proteins into the droplets, and then did, uh, did some fluorescence recovery after photobleaching experiments. And so you, know, you, you bleach a, um, a, a section of the droplet and then wash to see if it recovers. If it doesn't recover, that means things are, are really static. And indeed in both cases with lipids or proteins, it does recover. And the, you know, the, what it basically tells us is that these um, you know, entrapped materials are indeed mobile and can interact with one another. And so then to, you know, one other question we had then in terms of particularly for mimicking lipid membrane, synth sorry, lipid synthesis, is um, can we you know, host membrane proteins in these droplets? And that turns out to be really straightforward. You can dissolve your membrane protein in the IGPAL detergent and then just simply add the galactolipid to those micelles and that'll form the droplets. And so we did this with a very you know, well-known membrane protein, cytochrome C oxidase. And you can see this is fluorescently labeled cytochrome C oxidase. It, it goes readily into the droplets and then it's still functional. It can still oxidize fairy cytochrome C. And I think what's kind of neat is that, yes, you know, we can monitor that by absorbance, but because we have such a high surface area of bilayers, we can actually incorporate quite a bit of cytochrome C oxidase in these droplets. And so you can actually just by eye see the difference as you, you know, oxidize by cytochrome C. We also looked at, um, you know, more lipid synthesis type reactions. So here we've reconstituted diisoglycerol kinase. Um, and this is a membrane protein that phosphorylates diisoglycerol. And now we can take a lipid substrate and in the presence of magnesium and ATP, we can see that we can phosphorylate that lipid substrate. And so this is something that we're you know, using as a foundation to expand on the idea of trying to like, can we actually reconstitute more complex lipid synthesis pathways um, into these droplets? We can localize uh, peptides and proteases for degradation and see how that impacts the kinetics of degradation. So here we've taken droplets that can bind histag proteins we take a peptide substrate that has a coumarin that when cleaved fluoresces. And it turns out that peptide substrate on its own will localize to the droplet, maybe because of this coumarin. And then we can also take a protease, cathepsin um, K, that's his tag, and this will also bind to the droplets. And so now if we you know, just have these two in the bulk phase at these low concentrations, we see very little um, uh, hydrolysis of the peptide. If we add the detergents or add droplets that can't bind cathepsin K, 
we see a, a moderate increase in the um, degradation. And we think that's because we're, we're doing a better job solubilizing this peptide. But if now we add the droplets that combine both the cathepsin K and the peptide, we get this really nice increase in the fraction of the peptide hydrolyzed. So these droplets could be a really convenient platform for studying how co-localization and compartmentalization can affect the, the rate of biochemical reactions. So finally, we were interested in thinking about ways in which we can gain more control over you know, what and when the proteins go into these um, droplets. And so to do that, we were interested in using light then as a way of, 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 of having a, a stimuli control over protein partitioning. And so we took advantage of uh, these two proteins, photoreceptor phytochrome B and phytochrome interacting factor, phi B and PIF. And these are plant-based proteins that when you shine 660 nanometer light on them, they interact with each other. But when you shine 740 nanometer light, they, they separate. And so uh, Henrique and Hanjit uh, took these droplets and they localized phi B into the droplets and then uh, created a PIF GFP. And then now if you shine 740 nanometer light, these two would be separated. But if you shine 660 nanometer light, it should drive the PIF-GFP into the droplets. So that's a video I'm gonna play here <clears throat> where um, you can kind of make out the outline of the droplets here. This is the wavelength of light. So initially we're starting with these separated and then we'll turn on the 660 nanometer light and you know, the fluorescent proteins go in and then you, you know, turn on the other light, they go out and then this can be repeated over and over again. It's a reversible interaction. So with this in hand, we were curious whether or not we could try to you know, use light to sort of drive a protein into the droplets and protect it from sort of a protease that would be outside. So it's a little bit kind of different now from the previous experiment where we were co-localizing the protease with the, with, the, with the target. Now we're trying to separate them. And so we use as a, as a protease ClipXP, which is this really huge um, complex, about 600 kilodalton, about 10 nanometers in diameter, if you recall, the pore size of these droplets is four nanometers. So this, this protease can't get in. In fact, if you fluorescently label clip P, you can see it just stains the periphery of the droplet. It can't get inside. And then we can tag the PIF GFP um, such that it'll be recognized by clip XP. And so if we just have 740 nanometer light, so these two are separated, we see this nice rapid degradation of the target. But now if we intersperse in 660 nanometer light, you can actually see a really uh, decrease in the rate of degradation. And this line here, so what we've done here is we have it you know, in the droplet, slowly degrading, then you shine 740 nanometer, expel it from the droplet, it gets much faster. Then you go back in the droplet, out of the droplet, back in the droplet, out of the droplet. So again, this is a you know, nice little handle, I think, to have, and it really shows, I think, the degree of control one can have over you know, performing experiments, studying how co-localization affects um, biological reactions. And what I just want to end by saying that, you know, one thing we're really excited about is we were recently um, supported by um, a, a MURI grant to um, look at more carefully at these droplets. And so we've got, got this really great team of investigators that are coming together to ask various questions about how these droplets can be used to, to organize biology. And with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and, you know, thank the, um, the organizers again for the invitation. I really want to thank my, my group, you know, it really shares a passion like myself for, you know, science at the discipline, at the interface of, you know, chemistry and biology, the interface of disciplines. And, uh, you know, I want to thank all our sources of uh, funding and, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Devaraj, for that amazing talk. Um, we do have a few questions already from the audience. I, I myself have two just quick technical questions to ask mm -hmm. you. Um, um, the first, um, are the droplets temperature sensitive? Um, Did yeah, you think, look at that as a handle? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think if you go uh, too low in temperature, they'll start to, you know, aggregate or have problems. But, but we didn't really look at that very carefully. But it's a good, it's a very good question. Okay, and then I guess kind of leading into that, I'm just wondering if you've thought about um, multi-compartment architectures uh, where you might be able to recapitulate, say, like the periphery versus membrane trafficking that we actually see in real life? Yeah, that's really a great question. Um, we definitely have been thinking about it. I mean, one kind of wild idea I've been thinking about is since we can now reconstitute membrane proteins, could you actually um, 
you know, having in like lipid synthesizing reactions inside the, the these these sponge phase droplets to make um, lipid droplets. So if you look at sort of the models in which, you know, lipid droplets are thought to be made from the ER, you know, you have a sort of yeah. ER network of bilayers and then you're making these triacylglycerols and these triacylglycerols are supposed to sort of bud off and, and form these, you know, droplets are coated by a monolayer of phospholipid. And so that's actually something I'm kind of really interested in is can we reconstitute those proteins um, into the, into these droplet systems and see if we can actually make, you know, lipid droplets that way. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, okay. We have a question from Jan Steinkuhler. He asks, did you look closer at the dynamics of sponge droplet fusion? I could imagine that it would require rearrangement, fusion or fission of the sponge membranes and be more complex, slower than fusion of normal droplets in a continuous phase. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, we didn't look at it very carefully, um, but I, and it's something that we've been really interested in is can we, you know, what can we do to control the the fusion, or even can we, you know, have these droplets undergo fission as well, but even just, you know, fusion rates, that's something that's really interesting. And one thing we've been looking at a little bit is, you know, how does the, the loading of proteins into the droplets or potentially decorating the droplets with other types of biomolecules like DNA, how does that affect the, um, the, the coalescence and fusion rates? But um, the short answer, we didn't do a really good job quantitating that, but it's something that we're, we want to do more of looking forward. Great. Uh, next question um, uh, starts with a statement. Galactolipids can self-assemble into rod-like micelles in water. Um, by partly removing the agapulf, can you morphologically reconfigure or elaborate the droplets with the cytoskeletal-like galactolipid filamentous network? And this is from Professor Steve Mann um, from Bristol. Yeah, that's a great question, Steve. Thanks. Um, so one thing I should point out, and this is really quite fascinating, is um, glycolipids can form stiff rod-like structures. But what's interesting is you mostly see that from glucose, modif the exact same um, lipids that we worked with. Instead of galactose being a head group, if glucose is a head group, you get these really um, rod stiff like structures. And that, that had been known for many years. Um, um, and so it's really, I mean, quite fascinating if you think about just changing that one OH um, has now made it so that when you have these galactolipids, you can make um, vesicles. But it is true that we, we have also observed, we've published on this, that yeah, even the galactolipids can undergo transformations into rod-like structures. So we, we, I think we played around a little bit trying to, you know, either, you know, mix in these other types of lipids that can form rod-like structures. But um, I think typically when we have these mixtures, we were never able to, I guess, see, if, I, if I'm understanding what you're getting at, the idea that like, you know, you'd have sort of a vesicle or a droplet and then have like more cytoskeletal-like elements coexisting at the same time. I guess that is kind of a tricky thing in terms of like having, you know, multiple amplifiles coexisting in phase, in, into separate phases at the same time. Um, I guess, you know, biology is able to do this. I think that's what's kind of, you know, remarkable. You have so many different membranes coexisting and, and, and sometimes even different phases coexisting. But that's something we haven't uh, been able to gain control of over yet. But thanks. Good. Uh, Matt Good uh, says, very cool work, Neil. Have you tested strategies to alter membrane surface area to volume ratio to manipulate droplet morphology? For example, through fusion with small vesicles, alteration of osmolarity or feeding amplifiles into the solution? Yeah, a great question. And I think our main approach, I mean, all those techniques would be interesting to try. And um, you know, I think the osmolarity approach in particular is very interesting. Um, as chemists, you know, we've been really focused on, um, you know, synthesizing lipids. And so the, where, where we've been really kind of emphasizing our efforts is in trying to expand the membrane through lipid synthesis to try to um, play with that um, um, balance between the surface area and volume to try to get shape transformations. So where we're at now is, you know, we have previously observed and I think, um, you know, we, we've some, sort of seen like sometimes when we feed um, the precursors and, and generate additional membrane that we'll see sometimes shape transformation, but it's not very well controlled. And so I think one of the issues is that um, in the current system that we're working with, we're always relying on single chain amplifiles as the precursor. And the single chain amplifiles, as you know, they'll, they'll be detergents. And so you kind of have this problem where if you add too much, it starts disrupting the membrane, you start creating pores, you know, um, so, and one of the things that we've been working on um, more now is 
can we develop ways in which we feed not single chain amplifiles, but like non amplifiles precursors that eventually get converted chemically to phospholipids or phospholipid, non canonical phospholipids? And that's you know, how biology synthesizes membranes. And we, in fact, we have a paper that's about to come out soon, but it's on, it's on bioarchive where we've shown that we can actually reconstitute a type one fatty acid synthase that can take acetyl CoA and malonyl CoA and make it into palmitol CoA. And then that gets immediately converted to phospholipid by one of our native chemical ligation type reactions. And so that's kind of nice because in that system, you can actually feed acetyl CoA and malonyl CoA in to try to generate um, additional membrane area. Um, a sort of loosely associated question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they ask, is it possible to tune the pore size by addition of large lipid head groups or um, long chains of PEG? Yeah, that's a, another fascinating question. So we initially tried to play around and I kind of briefly showed up um, different chain lengths of glycolipids. And you know, with the X-ray data, we didn't really see too much of a change in pore size, but just recently, I mean, just last week, we had a meeting with some of our collaborators and it turns out that one way in which we might be able to change the pore size is kind of what I think what the, 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 the member is asking uh, is by changing the amount of phospholipid we dope into the droplet. So it does appear that by changing the ratio of the phospholipid we dope in, this is actually can have a pretty severe effect on the pore size. And so at least from the x-ray data. So I think that'll be really exciting. That's something we've been kind of on the lookout for is we'd love to be able to control you know, the, the pore size and, and do it in like in a way that which we could actually have stimuli control would be really interesting. Great, all right, last question um, from Hamanchi Singh. Uh, they say, hi, great talk. Have you considered the application of sponge droplets into food sensor or packaging, uh, such as absorbing the toxins if detected, detected in the packaging, possibly a bit of an industrial use? That's a really nice idea. No, we haven't really thought too much on, I would say the industrial side. We have, you know, thought a little bit about drug delivery or, um, um, you know, sort of, you know, sequestering proteins, things like that. But, you know, one of the challenges there is of course the cytocompatibility of the droplets, which, you know, is a little tricky with all the detergents. So we're actually exploring other systems that might be more biocompatible, like other detergent systems. Um, but I think to your point, great idea because I think if you're thinking about things from the more industrial or packaging standpoint, you know, now it doesn't necessarily have to be so compatible with cells. Um, so yeah, I mean, the application side is something we're really interested in. And again, I think by, you know, exploring other kinds of detergents that can form these systems. And, and there are others that are out there. Um, in fact, you know, uh, for example, Fred Menger and, and some other people have looked at uh, systems that can form these kinds of sponge droplets that they sort of left it at that. They sort of said, okay, look, we saw it, it makes a sponge droplet. And then they sort of moved on. And I think now I think what's cool is we have this opportunity as a community with, with synthetic biology where it is, we can start using these droplets as potential organelles, programming proteins that go in, making these sort of more interesting systems. And so we're, we're starting to revisit, you know, those kinds of systems. And some of these, I think will be more um, potentially, you know, maybe uh, appropriate for certain applications in the presence of cells, for example, or in packaging or things like that. Yeah. Indeed. Okay, one last question actually now. Uh, so Gabriel Lopez says, beautiful work. Is there a means of controlling the size of the lipid sponges? Your last slides implied an interfacial boundary layer. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think one, one approach might be to like, like controlling that interface. So one um, idea would be to um, prevent the coalescence by you know, decorating the surface with a, um, a repulsive molecule. And so one thing that we've been exploring, actually um, uh, Henrique Nierholmeyer, who did a lot of this work that I talked about, she's now at the Max Planck as a, a group leader there. Um, and so uh, we've been working on um, actually developing a manuscript where we're talking about modifying um, the uh, droplets with DNA. And so she's actually gotten some really mm -hmm. nice data on that. And so, um, you know, one thing we've seen, we can actually, if you make the DNA large enough that it doesn't actually go through the pores, you can decorate just the surface of the droplets and you can see that. But if you have fluorescent DNA, you know, just the periphery lights up. And so this could offer a way in which you can now start potentially controlling the coalescence, maybe controlling the size, um, potentially even programming like what gets decorated on the droplets. So we're really excited about that direction as well. Great, well, thank you for the excellent Q&A session and your talk today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank um, okay, you. Okay, so 
Yeah, thanks. We're going to move on now um, to our contributed speaker today, um, who, which is going to be by Dr. Emiliano Altamira, who is a researcher at the University of Body in the Chemistry Department. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Altamira. You're welcome. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Jacqueline, for the introduction. I'm uh, Emiliano Altamura a researcher at uh, the chemistry department of the University of Bari. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you about my work entitled Light-Driven ATP Production Promotes RNA Biosynthesis Inside Hybrid Multi-Compartment Artificial Protocells. Um, just for uh, geolocate myself, I'm speaking from uh, Bari. Uh, that is in Puglia, uh, a region called the Hill of Italy in the south, where you can find good food, good weather, Caribbean Sea, and of course, good science. So I really invite you to visit this wonderful region of Italy. Back to science. So our project is related to the construction of uh, artificial simplified autotrophic protocells with a semi-synthetic bottom-up approach. This architecture uh, must be capable to transduce light energy in chemical energy stored as ATP molecules. We used two different approaches, a single compartment approach and a multi-compartment approach. In the first one, uh, the building blocks are single protein complexes extracted from living organisms and then reconstituting the bilayer of an artificial compartment. In the second one, um, the second one uses fragments of biological membranes that can act as photosynthetic organelles within the artificial compartment. The organism we choose from which extract these building blocks is the purple bacterium Rhodobactus pheroides. These bacteria, uh, in particular uh, grow conditions, uh, uh, form spontaneously membrane invaginations called ICM, intracytoplasmic membranes, that contain their entire photosynthetic apparatus. Photosynthetic machinery consists of three protein complexes. The reaction center, RC, the BC1 complex, and the ATP synthase. Under continuous irradiation, reaction center and BC1, uh, BC1 complex are coupled to produce a redox photocycle that generates a proton gradient across the cytoplasmic membrane. This proton gradient is then exploited by the ATP synthase to synthesize ATP from ADP and uh, phosphate. For the single compartment approach, uh, we focus the attention on the reaction center protein um, that is the first protein complex involved in the transduction process. The RC has been extracted, purified, and labeled with the fluorescent antenna. The red ring uh, um, in the <coughs> confocal image confirms the RC reconstitution in the lipid bilayer of the giant vesicle. A green hydrophilic uh, dye has been uh, encapsulated to demonstrate that giant vesicles were sealed and no leakage occurred. With an orientation assay, uh, we could prove uh, an alignment uh, uh, of the protein of 90% with the uh, physiological orientation. It means that the uh, reaction center is capable to translocate protons from the internal volume of the vesicle to the exterior, um, external environment. This was confirmed in these confocal uh, images um, in which uh, under continuous near infrared illumination, the grid fluorescence uh, increases inside the giant vesicles due to the presence of the pH sensitive dye spiranin that increases its fluorescence uh, as the pH increases. With quantitative anal image analysis, uh, we could calculate uh, um, an internal pH increase of 0 0.061 pH units per minute. Moving to the multi-component approach, um, when the cell is broken, uh, several processes occur. The preformed vesicles are released. The intracytoplasmic membrane vaginations pinch off, uh, while the tubular vesicles uh, are fragment and seal, producing the bacterial vesicles uh, called chromatophores. Uh, 
These nanometric compartments uh, um, generally have uh, uh, the photophosphorylation machinery in their membrane with an inside out orientation. It means with the, the F1 domain of the ATP synthase um, pointing outward and uh, also encapsulate uh, um, cytochrome C2 in the reduced form in their internal volume. In this way, they can produce ATP under continuous illumination externally, so they can act as photosynthetic organelles for artificial compartments, such as giant vesicles. Obtain a high yield of chromatophores with the desired orientation of the photophosphorylation machinery, we have employed an extraction procedure uh, based on direct cell lysis by a single French press passage, followed by a first centrifugation uh, in order to uh, remove the cell debris from the sample, and then the solution has been ultra centrifuged to obtain chromatophores as pellet. Chromatophores give uh, this spectrum with the characteristic uh, peak at 860 nanometer for the R26 uh, mutant strain of the Rhodobacter spheroides bacteria that has been used for this study. Um, this spectrum also shows, uh, uh, this spectrum lacked the peaks of the carotenoid and the, the light harvesting complexes too. Chromatophore diameter was measured by dynamic light scattering, giving uh, uh, a mean value of uh, uh, 80 nanometers, while uh, the pot uh, zeta potential uh, was uh, minus 30.9 millivolt, as expected for the presence of roughly 60% uh, of anionic phospholipids in the rhodobacter spheroidis membrane. Cryo-electron microscopy and cryo-electron tomography confirmed the presence of closed uh, spheroid, spheroidal chromatophores, although some elongated vesicles and open fragments uh, are also present in the sample. Direct inspection of cryo-EM images revealed the presence of the F1 domain of the ATP synthase uh, in the functional orientation on the membrane of closed chromatophores. On average, uh, we found 1.6 ATP synthase per chromatophore, all being outward oriented and thus able to produce ATP in the external solution. In no cases, um, inward oriented ATP synthase were found. Uh, the, ATP uh, the ATP synthase surface density can be estimated combining DLS and cryo-EM analysis, obtaining 80 ATP synthase per uh, micron square. In order to be functional, uh, chromatophores with uh, uh, an inside out uh, morphology should also contain a sufficient uh, amount of cytochrome C2 uh, in their lumen, in the reduced form. We have determined the ratio between functional chromatophores and all other types uh, uh, of non-functional particles and fragments by a light flash excitation experiments. Um, in this essay, the uh, RC spectral change at 860 nanometer due uh, to a photo-induced charge separated state is recorded immediately after the flash. From the difference between the amplitudes obtained before and after the addition of the detergent to the sample, we determine that 70% of the total amount of the chromatophores are in the functional state. It means with the, the F1 domain of the ATP synthase uh, facing outwards and containing uh, a sufficient amount of cytochrome C2 in the reduced form. They said also chromatophores in bulk for their capacity to produce ATP in the external medium upon continuous illumination in the presence of externally added ADP and phosphate. The amount of synthesized ATP after three minutes uh, of uh, near infrared uh, light irradiation was quantified by the luciferin luciferase bioluminescence assay according to a, a calibration line. Um, the ADP to ATP conversion is high but not completed, around 60%, independently uh, to the amount of the ADP added. The measured production um, of 1.2 millimolar uh, ATP in three minutes corresponds to an estimated ATP uh, synthase turnover number of 80 uh, seconds to the minus one. That is in good agreement with the highest reported value in literature that are 50 and 90 seconds to the minus one. <laughs> 
After that, we tried to encapsulate chromatophores within giant vesicles using uh, the droplet transfer method as preparation method. Uh, preliminarily, chromatophores were labeled with uh, the fluorescent dye nail red. Uh, after that, uh, they were uh, added to internal uh, aqueous solution that has been uh, emulsified in a water in a mineral oil suspension and uh, um, obtain by pipetting this uh, emulsion that is stabilized by the lipids dispersed in a mineral oil solution. Uh, then the emulsion is uh, stratified above a uh, biphasic system, and then the centrifugation allow the droplet to cross the interface region and obtain vesicles uh, as a pellet. The confocal images confirmed the um, well-localized uh, fluorescence due to the labeled chromatophores, uh, again indicating that uh, um, vesicles were sealed. Photocells prepared with all required components were then assayed for ATP production. In the presence of ADP and phosphate, the photoredox reactions can cycle very efficiently because the pH gradient and the electrochemical potential are continuously generated by light absorption and thereafter dissipated by ATP synthase. The quantification of intraprotocell ATP can be carried out again by the luciferin luciferase bioluminescence assay after releasing uh, ATP uh, from uh, uh, the protocell interior. Preliminary experiments show that detergent-based lysis interferes with the assay. So ATP was released from protocells and quantified after freezing and towing the sample. The average concentration of intraprotocell uh, intra ATP has been calculated with the star standard addition method. Having shown that protocell and produce ATP from photon energy, um, then uh, our photosynthetic protocells were built by including in the protocell lumen ADP phosphate, a linearized plasmid as DNA template, the enzyme T7 RNA polymerase, and the three nucleotides GTP, UTP, and CTP. Uh, this because the ATP must be supplied by uh, our chromatophores. The fluorescent dye acrid in orange was added externally to perform uh, vesicles to evidence the RNA produced from the coupled photophosphorylation transcription pro uh, processes. Uh, acrid in orange binds both DNA and RNA, emitting a green light. Since the DNA concentration is constant, the variation of acrid in orange fluorescence is only due to the progress of transcription. The accumulation of RNA inside the, uh, our protocells is clearly detected by the increase of the acrylin orange RNA complex fluorescence in the confocal images. On the right is reported uh, the averaged inner fluorescence versus time obtained by quantitative image analysis of our protocells micro, uh, micrographs per each time interval. Because anti-ATP is the limiting reagent for T7 RNA polymerase, the transcription process ends after 90 minutes, indicating that all ADP has been converted in ATP. Okay, to summarize what I showed here in this talk, um, we have seen that a hybrid multi-compartment system can be assembled using uh, giant vesicles as artificial compartment and uh, chromatophore as biological photosynthetic organelles. Chromatophores are the simplest ready-to-use ATP producing building blocks and can be employed in a modular design of artificial protocells since we have seen that the encapsulation of chromatophores in giant vesicles with the uh, droplet transfer method is very easy and they retain their photoactivity. The ATP photo produced can sustain the DNA transcription process within the hybrid multi-compartment protocells. And I hope I convinced you that this hybrid design can be further expanded to include other easy to extract natural organelles, increasing the versatility of bottom-up approaches for the construction of arti artificial protocells. So I would like to thank all the collaborators of uh, this work starting from Fabio Mabelli and Paola Albanese from my group in Bari, Pasquale Stano at the University of Salento, Massimo Trotta and Francesco Milano at the CNR of Bari, Roberto Marotta at the 
IT of Genova and Michele Fiore of the University of Lyon. And of course, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Great, thank you so much for that excellent talk, um, Dr. Altamirda. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with a question. I'm, I'm just wondering about, um, so you show that you, you isolate the chromatophores on your own and if uh, there would be some scalability to this process. So for example, if we were, if you were talking about building um, a solar cell from these types of architectures, do you think that that would be a feasible extension of your work? Uh, can you repeat the, the question, sorry? Yeah, um, so I'm wondering if you think that in terms of scalability, could you actually um, purify enough material in order to implement some of your architectures into um, a solar cell for a, an, an idea of an application? Uh, well, uh, yeah, the, the process is scalable because uh, I mean, this extraction for my purpose starts with from uh, uh, one liter of culture of bacteria. So this is enough okay. to, to prepare my samples. But of course, uh, with the bioreactor, you can uh, uh, produce uh, tons of chromatophores because it's a very quite easy process to extract them. And uh, uh, the point is that uh, there's the advantage that uh, in this way, all the photosynthetic machinery is in the um, physiological environment. So the yield is the highest as possible outside the living beings. But of course, uh, uh, the stability is not, is not so long uh, uh, to create a device uh, uh, as they are, just extracted okay. from, from bacteria. The other point is that uh, uh, for this uh, study, we used uh, uh, the R26 uh, uh, mutant strain that is not the best choice uh, in efficiency, but is the best choice for, uh, to avoid any spectral interference because uh, this is, uh, I mean, Rhodobacter spheroides is a purple bacteria, but as you have seen uh, in the bottle, the bacteria appear green. So this is why we used all the dye in the green region because uh, we had this spectral window that was helpful for this purpose. But uh, uh, already uh, with the wild type strain, the efficiency increases a lot. And actually at the moment we are working with, with that. So I will give you a more precise answer in the future. Okay, great. We'll look forward to it. Um, okay, we have a question from Gabriel Lopez. He says, beautiful work. Is there a means of controlling the size of the lipid sponges? Uh, your last slides implied an inner... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that was from before. Um, still from him, though. For how long can the chromatophores uh, continue to produce ATP? And what ultimately limits the continued generation of ATP by chromatophores? Okay, so in, in this moment, uh, of course, the uh, limiting reagent is what we supply. So uh, we have uh, everything from the commercial kit for, for the uh, transcription that was in excess and uh, just the ADP was added by us. For just ATP production, it, now there is not uh, a cycle in order to re-hydrolyze uh, ATP to obtain again ADP. So it's not a cycle. So it's just one way reaction and there is not uh, um, another reaction that consume ATP. So we can uh, um, continuously monitor the uh, ATP producing of chromatophores. But just for stability, I can tell you that uh, uh, they continue to be photoactive for uh, four days stored at four degrees. This is okay. the best condition we found right now. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for sharing your work with us today. We greatly appreciate it. Um, okay, and then we'll just end today with a few more reminders. Um, just that next week we have two more speakers on May 17th leading into our virtual conference. Um, so we have next week, Professor Joachim Spatz and Dr. Ilya Platzman, both from the Max Planck Institute, Institute for Medical Research. Um, and that is all for today. So we thank everyone for your attention and we'll see you next time around. Thank you.